All right. Life's ultimate questions. We've been uh, going through those in the last month or so. And today, we talked about last week the decrees of God. And today, how, do we, how does God execute his decrees? How does he carry out those things which he has ordained from eternity past and how they begin to unfold in time and space? And let's read the answer together. God executes his decrees in the works of creation and providence. He carries out his decrees in the work of creation. And that's what he has decreed will be fulfilled and manifested in space and time, in the creation of the world. And as history begins to unfold, that's where his decrees begin to be manifested. But they're also carried out by providence. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, God's providential hand over the affairs of mankind, both for the saint as well as the sinner. God oversees all things. And so, as the Scripture says, what He wills, what He desires, what He has decreed will come to pass. And He will orchestrate, He will He will use men's choices and decisions, all of those things already factored into every single possibility and scenario. God knows infinitely all the possibilities of everything, and he already knows how things are going to unfold and how they're going to play out. And so he has an ultimate end that he is moving toward. Things are not moving randomly, willy-nilly along in this world. Things are moving according to a pattern, and they are moving according to a plan. And that goes down not only to the massive events that are taking place in the world, but down to our individual lives, down to the very smallest actions of the very smallest molecule in this universe. Everything is overseen by the providential hand of God. And God has the wisdom. God has the knowledge. God has the desire and the will and then the power to enforce and carry those things out. And he does that always ultimately for, especially for his people, our good in every single situation. So God's decrees, they're carried out. And of course, we see this in the scripture, Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power for you created, how many things? All things, and by your will, they exist and they were created. Every breath every human takes is by the will of God. Every single breath. When Jesus stopped speaking that breath into existence, you stop breathing. I mean, it is always in every moment by his will that we live and we exist. Daniel, in Daniel 4.35 says, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, in all domains, seen and unseen, God's will is done. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? That's a powerful God. Amen? And it's good to know that this God is our Abba, our Father. Amen? And if you will, open up your Bibles, please, to Isaiah, the sixth chapter. Isaiah chapter 6. I will tell you as uh, we continue to go through this series, this message for sure is one that I am going to fail miserably at, at being able to explain. It is impossible, absolutely and totally impossible for a human tongue or mind to be able to communicate the majesty, the seriousness, the beauty, the infinitude of the holiness of God. It is something that we will not comprehend or even grasp in any sense of the word, until we ultimately stand before him in the age to come. And only then we will be able to declare with all of the beings in heaven 
and to all of creation itself, the holiness of God. Even then, it will be something that we will not ever be able to truly comprehend or grasp, and something that we will be delighting in and discovering more of in all of the ages that unfold in the future. The holiness of God. The title really is true. It is the sinner's greatest fear, but it is the saint's greatest delight. As we began this series last week, looking at this eternal chain of redemption, we began with the link of sin and seeing the seriousness of sin, what sin is, its destructive power, its deceitfulness, its damnableness, how absolutely vehemently God hates sin. But we have to understand, why does God hate sin? Why is sin such a reprehensible thing to him? Why is it so detestable before him? The reason is because he is holy. That's why. He is a holy, holy God. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah got a vision of this. It says in verse 1, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When we talk about holiness and the holiness of God, it's important for us, just like we did with sin, to have some definitions of it. Because sometimes we can get some misconceptions about holiness in and of itself. We tend to think of holiness in terms of something being pure, something being free from any stain something that is wholly perfect and immaculate in every single way. And certainly, when you look in the Hebrew language and the Greek language, holiness does carry that kind of a definition. But it also carries with it another side of the coin, the flip side, another concept and understanding which has to do with something being separate and set apart. When you go into looking at the tabernacle, all of the instruments, all of the utensils, all of the things that were in there may have been outside of the temple, outside of the tabernacle, common things. Plates, bowls, those kinds of things. But what made them holy was that they were designated and set apart for use in that place by God. Therefore, they were declared to be and designated to be holy things. And when we think about God's holiness, it's in this aspect that we see His holiness. And there's a big word that theologians like to use when they talk about God's holiness, and that's the term transcendent. God's holiness is transcendent. And transcendence, the word itself, literally means to climb across. That there is a, there is a, there, there, there's a chasm and you're climbing across something. You're exceeding the usual limits of something. And when we think about God, God is truly above and beyond us. He is supreme. He is absolutely and completely great. He is consuming majesty and He is exalted above all. He is... 
as we would say about something that is immaculately created in this world, a, we would describe it as being a cut above something. Well, God truly is a cut above all and everything else. In reality, God is so far above us as humans and as his creation, he is foreign to us. He is foreign to us. We don't have anything in creation to compare him to, to relate to that we can look at and say, oh, well, God's like that or God's like this. We don't have anything to do that with. And so he is completely foreign to us. He alone is holy in himself. Now, holiness is not an attribute of God like love, grace, justice, mercy, kindness. Those are attributes. Those are character qualities of God. Holiness, though, is his essence. All that he is, is holy. His love is holy love. His justice is holy justice. His mercy is holy mercy. His grace is holy grace. Everything about him is holy because he in and of himself is holy. Back in the early 20th century, there was a German scholar named Rudolf Otto, and he did an in-depth study on the holy and he wanted to research and find out how people conceived it. What does holy truly mean? And he coined a special term for the holy. He called it the mysterium tremendum. A simple translation of that simply means the awful mystery. And he described it like this. He says, the feeling of it may at times come sweeping like a gentle tide pervading the mind with a tranquil mood of deepest worship. It may pass over into a more set and lasting attitude of the soul, continuing, as it were, thrillingly vibrant and resonant until at last it dies away and the soul resumes its profane, non-religious mood of everyday experience. It may burst in sudden eruption up from the depths of the soul with spasms and convulsions or lead to the strangest excitements, to intoxicated frenzy, to transport and to ecstasy. It has its wild and demonic forms and can sink to an almost grisly horror and shuddering. It has its crude, barbaric antecedents and early manifestations. And again, it may be developed into something beautiful, pure, and glorious. It may become the hushed, trembling, and speechless humility of the creature in the presence of whom or what? In the presence of that which is a mystery inexpressible and above all creatures. He spoke of this mystery as fearful and awfulness because of the fear that the holy provokes in us. The holy fills us with a kind of dread, he said. We use expressions like, my blood ran icy cold, or my flesh crept. Theologians have defined holiness in a lot of different ways. Louis Burkhoff in his book on theology said that God's holiness is first of all that divine perfection by which he is absolutely distinct from all his creatures and exalted above them in infinite majesty. But it denotes in the second place that he is free from all moral impurity or sin and therefore morally perfect in the presence of the holy God. Man is deeply conscious of his sin. A. A. Hodge says the holiness of God is not to be conceived as one attribute among others. It's rather a general term representing the conception of God's consummate perfection and total glory. It is his infinite moral perfection crowning his infinite intelligence and power. It is infinite moral perfection as the crown of the Godhead. Holiness is God's total glory crowned. Puritan Thomas Watson said, Holiness is the most sparkling jewel of God's crown. It is the name by which he is known. 
And Arl Dabney said, holiness is to be regarded not as a distinct attribute, but as the result of all of God's moral perfections together. Probably the one of the most prolific writers about, in a practical way, of the holiness of God last century was a man named A.W. Tozier. And he wrote a book called The Knowledge of the Holy. And in that book, he goes through talking about different aspects of the nature and character of God. But when he comes to the part of his book, when he begins to dive into this subject on the holiness of God, he feels like he's walking on very hollow ground. And he says this, holiness means purity, but purity doesn't describe it well enough. Purity merely means that which is unmixed with nothing else in it. But that isn't enough. We talk of moral excellency, but even that's not adequate. To be morally excellent is to exceed someone else in moral character. But when we say that God is morally excellent, who is it that he exceeds? The angels? The seraphim? Surely he does, but that still isn't enough. We mean rectitude, we mean honor, we mean truth and righteousness. We, we mean all of these, uncreated and eternal. God is not now any holier than he ever was. For he being unchanging and unchangeable can never become holier than he is. Never become holier than he is. And he was never holier than he is, and he'll never be any holier than now. His moral excellence implies self-existence, for he did not get his holiness from anyone, nor from anywhere. He didn't go off into some vast, infinitely distant realm and there absorb his holiness. He is himself the holiness. He is the all-holy, the holy one. He is holiness itself, beyond the power of thought to grasp or word to express, beyond the power of all praise. Language cannot express the holy. So God resorts to association and suggestion. He can't say it outright because he would have to use words for which we know no meaning. He would have to translate it down into our unholiness. If he were to tell us how white he is, we would understand it in terms of dingy gray. God cannot tell us by language. So he uses association and suggestion and shows us how holiness affects the unholy. He shows Moses at the burning bush before the holy fiery presence, kneeling down to take his shoes from his feet, hiding his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And all the trumpeting and the voice and the fire and the smoke and the shaking of the mount, this was God saying by suggestion and association what we could not understand. In words. Again, as you see, these men, they're all t- grasping at terms to describe something that really cannot be described. It can be experienced. It can be felt. It can be known, but certainly not adequately described. When we look at God's holiness, God's holiness is revealed in his works. When we talked about a little while ago, the decrees of God, where are the decrees of God manifested? Where do they play out? They play out in the works of creation and in providence. One of the places that we see the holiness of God manifested is in the creation itself. When you look at the first chapters of the book of Genesis, you remember that at the end of Genesis chapter 1, God saw all that he was made and he declared it what? No, very good. Not just good, but very good. That's a reflection of his essential nature. It couldn't be anything else but that. On the previous days, it was said that everything was good. But when he, and he applied it to all the specific details of his creation, but then when everything was done and everything was crowned, he declared it very, very good in its totality. His holiness is revealed in his creation. His holiness is also, we see in the Scripture, revealed in his law. I mean, the Scripture tells us that that in God's law, we find his absolute perfection revealed. Psalm says the law of the Lord is perfect. Paul said the law is holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. 
Everything that comes from God, every manifestation of nature is a reflection of His moral perfection. His holiness is revealed in His judgments. All of His verdicts, all of the decisions that He made, all of His adjudications from the divine bench are holy. Genesis, when Abraham was questioning God, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Paul says in Timothy that God is the righteous judge. Every representation, every manifestation of God, every revelation of God indicates to us his absolute perfection. To think anything else other than this is to be what James would say, deceived. You can see God's glimpses of God's holiness in his tabernacle and in his temple even in the very incense that was to be used there before God, a recipe which God said was never, ever, ever to be used again by anyone else for personal use, and if they did, they would be killed because that which belonged to the Lord was distinct from his creation. He's holy. No better place can we see the holiness of God revealed than in his incarnation. And when he became a human being, his holiness is made visible to human eyes. Remember when the angel came to Mary in Luke chapter 1, and he told Mary, he said, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary answered the angel and said, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel said this, The Holy Spirit. What spirit? Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, that holy offspring which will be born of you will be called the Son of God. Notice it is the Holy Spirit who is conceiving holy offspring in the womb of the Virgin Mary. All that Jesus was, all that Jesus said, all that Jesus did was holy. You remember Peter's response when Jesus at the manifestation of the miracle of the catching, the great catch of fish, the first thing Peter did, even before hauling the nets into the boat and all of that, he fell down on his knees before Jesus and and covered his head and said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. In the manifestation of his power, and he was in the presence of someone who was foreign to him. Frightening. Scary. The holiness of God and his perfection manifested there in the incarnation. Here in our passage in Isaiah chapter 6, several things we want to take note of very quickly. We have a declaration that is made by these seraphim. God's glory, His throne is manifested there in the temple. And the seraphim are standing above Him, each having six wings. Two they cover their face, two they cover their feet, and with two they flew. Seraphim are unique angelic beings. They have a special, unique relationship to the very throne of God and to His holiness. But notice, even they cannot look on God's holiness. Their faces are covered. They cannot look on it. Their feet are covered. Even though they are morally perfect beings, pure Just like when men would stand in the presence of God and they had to take their shoes off because they were on holy ground. These angelic beings, their very feet are covered because they're in the presence of the holy. And with two, they do fly. 
And as they are flying, they are declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. They use what's called the trisagion, the thrice holy declaration, the three times holy. It's a, it's a, it's a form in the Hebrew language of something that you're emphasizing. And you want people to understand it. It's the same thing as when Jesus would say, truly, truly, I say to you. Or even the term, amen, amen. We want there to be emphasis on what's being declared. We want people's attention to be given to it because it's very, very important. We know that in heaven, in Revelation chapter 4, verses 3 through 2 through 11 there, we see this heavenly vision that John is caught up into. And again, he sees these beings around the throne of God, and there they are day and night, day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. You see, even in heaven, God's separateness, God's moral perfection is being declared. He, it, it's, it's, it's being shouted to all of creation. Holy is the Father, as we read a go, minute ago. Holy is the Son. Holy is the Spirit, the three in one. He is holy. And they are emphasizing the fact that God is utterly, absolutely unique, distinct, and different in His perfection than any others. Even Isaiah, as he sees this, even the inanimate objects in the temple are responding to the holy presence of God. It says in the verse 4 that the foundations of the threshold shook. Uh, the voice of him who was calling out, the wood and stone itself shook at the very presence of God. But the one who quaked the most was Isaiah. The one who quaked the most was Isaiah. And what he began to do, he began immediately to say these words, woe is me. Do you know what he was doing? He was pronouncing a curse on himself. When you said woe to someone, you were declaring a curse or judgment from God upon them. And he was pronouncing judgment on himself. He was calling down the curse on himself because he said, I, I am ruined. Because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live in the people, midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He's saying, I'm ruined. I'm coming undone. I'm coming apart at the seams. I am coming unraveled as a creature. It would be like taking a piece of cloth and just ripping it to shreds and all of those threads beginning to tear apart from one another. Isaiah said, this is what's happening to me because I'm in the presence of a foreign someone that I have nothing to compare to that is frightful, terrorizing my ice, my blood is running icy cold in me. I can't stand what I'm seeing. I am undone. I'm coming apart, literally. Psychologists would say what he was experiencing was a disintegration in his being. See, to integrate something is when you take and put pieces together so that they form a unified whole. You integrate them all together. But when you disintegrate, they're all coming apart. And Isaiah was a man, we would say, looking at him from an outward standpoint and from his walk. He was a man of integrity. He was a whole integrated man. He walked according to God's commands. He wanted to be obedient to God. And we'd say, this man is a man of integrity, integrated in every way. But in the presence of God and seeing God in his radiant perfection and in his holiness, he was exposed. Like Adam and Eve naked in the garden, Isaiah was exposed. And he was coming apart. He was groveling. He was terrified. And he was exposed before the holy gaze of God, nowhere to hide. And that's a pattern in Scripture whenever people encounter God. 
whether they encountered him in a supernatural way like this or even encountering Jesus. There was always this sense of confrontation where God confronts us in our daily life, wherever, what were these people were going about. And then in the midst of that confrontation or circumstance, he reveals there's revelation of himself to them. And in particular, there's always this nuance of the holiness and distinct otherness of God that's foreign to them. And people cannot do but one thing, fall down and worship. It's a response. They understand that they are in the presence of something foreign, someone foreign that they cannot even relate to. And it's so pure and so absolutely perfect, they feel their own uncleanness. They feel their own filth. They feel the fact that they cannot hide and be, they're exposed completely in every way to this being. And all the secrets of their heart are known. Everything. And they stand before him, as we saw last week, without excuse. And then eventually God gives them a commission. He sends them to do something, just like he does with Isaiah. He does a work of cleansing him from what he needed to be cleansed from, and then he gave him a mission to go and represent him as his prophet. As we saw last week, God being a holy God, God must always judge sin. Because sin is the complete opposite to everything that he is. And it is his mortal enemy. Because it stands and is absolutely opposed to all that he is. And he always must punish it. Look, if you will, back in Leviticus chapter 10. And notice how God absolutely ascribes his judgments to a relationship to his holiness. Leviticus chapter 10. Verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered what kind of fire? Strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses and Aaron said, It is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I will be treated as what? Holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron, therefore, kept silent. These are his boys. And now they've been killed by God. Why? Because they did not treat God as holy. And God manifested his judgment against their sin. Holy God must always judge sin. And then there's another little strange story in relationship to this. Over in the book of 2 Chronicles. Look over there, if you will. 2 Chronicles chapter 13. Maybe that's not right. Maybe it's first. Ah, yes. First Chronicles, not second Chronicles. Or as the British say, one Chronicles. One Chronicles. Chapter 13. If you have a hard time finding that, go from two back to one, okay? Chapter 13, verse 2. David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and if it's from the Lord our God, let us send everywhere to our kinsmen who remain in all the land of Israel... Also to the priests and the Levites who are with them in their cities with pasture lands that they may meet with us. And let us bring back the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. Then all the assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of the people. Remember the Philistines had had the ark, and then of course they sent it back, and it had stayed for a while in a brother's barn. So anyway, it's, it's been out there for a while. So David's going to go get it and bring it back to Jerusalem. And so David assembled all of Israel together from the Shihor of Egypt, even to the entrance of Hamath, to bring the ark of God from Kiriath-Jerim. David and all the people went up to Baalah, that is, to Kiriath-Jerim, which belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, the Lord who is enthroned above the cherubim where his name is called. They carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. 
David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, even with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals and with trumpets. And boy, this is a big profession. It's a big deal. And when they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, Kidon, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark because the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, so he struck him down because he put his hand to the ark and he died there before God. Then David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. And he called that place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of God that day, saying, how can I bring the ark home to me? So David took the ark, did not take the ark with him to the city of David, but took it inside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Uzzah, they're coming along in the ark, I mean, in this cart. They've got the ark sitting in this cart. The oxen trip, and of course the cart begins to do this, and the ark begins to do this, and so Uzzah which you think would be just a normal, natural thing to do. Hey, we don't want God's throne to fall off onto the ground, so I'm going to steady it. And he reached out to steady it, and God killed him. But Uzzah was not an innocent man. Uzzah knew better. He was not punished without a warning. There was nothing that took place in this act of divine judgment that he was not fully aware of that would happen. It takes us by surprise because it was so sudden, so immediate, that God struck him and killed him for doing that. Just like David was offended and he was immediately angered, just like with Nahab, Nadab, and Abihu, we're like, why, 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 God, did you do this? We find these things, as one writer says, difficult to stomach because we don't understand four vitally important concepts. Holiness, justice, sin, and grace. We do not understand what it means to be holy. We don't understand what justice is. We don't understand what sin is. We don't understand what grace is. You see, Uzzah was a Kohathite. Kohathites had specific instructions. Even though they were Levi, of the tribe of Levi, they weren't Levitical priests. They had responsibilities in the tabernacle, but none of those responsibilities had anything to do with the ark. They were forbidden to touch it. Already written down. The Kohathites were only allowed to deal with certain articles in the tabernacle and and help load those things, but the ark, they could not touch it. They weren't even to look on it. And Uzzah knew that. They were trained in all of these things. And so what he did was as if God needed his help to not fall off the cart. He was going to help God out, and in so doing, violated what he knew because it was specifically told that if they did that, they would die. It's written down in the book of Exodus and Leviticus. He was not ignorant. God was not treated as holy. And God killed him. Again, this is such shocking to us when we read this because we think, this is foreign. <laughs> we thought God's good. Well, he is. But remember, he's holy. He's holy. You remember in Acts chapter 5 when Ananias and Sapphira came into the assembly of the believers and they lied to the Holy Spirit and God killed them. And it put fear in the people's hearts. People were beginning to forget God is holy and he will not be treated in any manner that is not holy. You see, we take a broad-minded view of sin today. As I said last week, we've redefined it. Our thinking kind of goes like this. If there's a God at all, well, he's certainly not holy. And if for some reason he is holy, he's not just. 
And even if he is holy and he is just, we don't need to be afraid because his grace and his mercy override his holiness and his justice. And if we can stomach his holy and his just character, well, we can rest in one thing. He doesn't possess wrath. And if we think soberly about it for five seconds, as one writer says, we must see our error. If God is holy at all, if God has an ounce of justice in his character, indeed, if God exists as God, how could he possibly be anything but angry with us? We violate his holiness. We insult his justice. We make light of his grace. And none of these things can hardly please him. What's hard for us to swallow is, as I said last week, that we are all sinners. And God is holy. And because of our sinful condition and God's holiness, man, in his natural unconverted state, and this is hard for us to grasp, but it's biblical, man hates God. He hates God. God. We don't want him to rule over us. We don't want him to have any say in our life. We don't want him telling us what we can and cannot do. We want to do what we want, not what he wants. And if you do not believe that man hates God, you have but one place to only go and look. And you know where that's at? The cross. You will see man's utter Hatred for God displayed full bore for all the world to see at Calvary. Man hates God because man is a sinner, a rebel, and God is holy. Our nature and our attitude, R.C. Spool says, toward God is one of mere indifference. It's a posture of malice. We oppose his government We refuse his rule over us. Our natural hearts are devoid of affection for him. They're cold, frozen to his holiness. By nature, the love of God is not in us. As Edwards noted, it's not enough to say that the natural human mind views God as an enemy. We must be more precise. God is our mortal enemy. He represents the highest possible threat to our sinful desires. His repugnance to us is absolute, knowing no lesser degrees. No amount of persuasion from philosophers or theologians can induce us to love God. We despise his very existence and would do anything in our power to rid the universe of his holy presence. If God were to expose his life to our hands, he would not be safe for a second. We would not ignore him, we would destroy him. This charge may seem extravagant and irresponsible until we examine once more the record of what happened when God did appear in Christ. Christ was not simply killed. He was murdered by malicious people. The crowds howled for his blood. It was not enough merely to do away with him, but it had to be done with the accompaniment of scorn and humiliation. We know that his divine nature did not perish on the cross. It was his humanity that was put to death. Had God exposed the divine nature to execution, had he made his divine essence vulnerable to the executioner's nails, then Christ would still be dead. And God would be absent from heaven. Had the sword pierced the soul of God, the ultimate revolution would have been successful and mankind would now be king. You see, holy is the way God is. He doesn't compare to a standard. He is the standard in every way. And you see, whatever is holy is healthy. It's whole. Evil, sin, is moral sickness. So if God desires for the universe to be morally healthy and morally pure, then anything that is contrary to that is under his moral displeasure. He has to deal with it. 
He must destroy whatever would destroy it. He has to. And whenever he rises up in judgment, when you see it in the Scripture and in history played out, it is always to judge evil and to remove it from his world and save his world and his creation for moral ruin. And when we see that, the Scripture says and uses the terminology that God is angry. And again, his anger is not a human kind of anger. It's not flying into a rage or a fit because he's not getting his way. He's rising up justly to deal with something that is absolutely ruinous to his will for his creation, and it's destroying it. And that goes for the whole of his creation all the way down to my individual life and yours as well. Whenever God deals with sin in us, as we talked about a few weeks ago when we talked about God being a consuming fire, we know what that fire feels like. For when we sin, we immediately feel that pain in our conscience. We immediately feel that twinge of, uh uh-oh, that guilt of, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Mm, We feel that. Why? Because God being holy and you are a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, something contrary to his nature and his character has entered your life that is going to bring ruin to you, that is, a, a, is part of this disease in the universe that's going to corrupt you, and it is contrary to his purpose for you, his best for you, leading you into spiritual and moral health. Christ's likeness. So he has to rise up and deal with it. That's why we confess to God. We acknowledge our sin. We agree with him. Because we're saying, you're right, that's wrong. And I don't want that in my life. Therefore, I repent of it. And I turn away from it because what's entering into my life is ruinous to me. God always has to judge sin. Every single act of God's judgment has always been and will always be an act of moral preservation to preserve and to save his creation. When Jesus returns to the earth and sets up his kingdom, Peter tells us that the whole of his creation is going to be judged and purged with fire. It's going to be Fire, the fire of the presence of God that is going to cleanse and purify this earth and all of his creation to remove the evil that's there, the imperfection, that which is contrary to his holy nature. Our hope and the hope of every human being is that God appears in human shape, and his name is called Jesus. And Jesus comes to do something about this conflict between man and God. He comes to reconcile us. He comes to save, to heal, and to restore, and to forgive us of our sins. And to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. And bring us into the presence of his holy father as holy children. He not only represents us and lives the life that we could never live for us. But he dies the death we deserve to die. He suffers the wrath of God on the cross against us against our sin, against our unholiness. He takes that into himself, and it is punished. It is dealt with in him and buried in the deepest depths of infinite eternity, forever removed, so that when we trust him, we enter into that relationship, he comes in to dwell in us, and we then are holy We now are holy beings. We are now, as we've been looking at on Wednesday nights in 1 Peter, foreigners. 
in this present world. We are dwelling alongside individual human beings who are not like us, who don't know the Lord. We're another species than they are. Spiritually speaking, we're from another planet. We're holy people. And Jude tells us, and Peter tells us, and Paul tells us that one day he will present us before the throne of his glory spotless. The Holy Spirit has come to indwell you and I to make us holy in our character and our conduct. To make us set apart different and to make us pure and morally perfect to make us like Jesus. Now we walk with God, a holy God. We're able to enter into his presence blameless. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There was an exchange on the cross. You see, on the cross, God treated Jesus as a sinner. He dealt with him in that way. He didn't become sin because he's perfect and pure. He couldn't do that. But he was dealt with as a sinner would be dealt with in judgment. He took upon himself his own wrath like a sinner would. The wrath that you deserved, the wrath that I deserved, he took it into himself. And then he plunged that wrath out. He satisfied it to the perfect nth degree. There's not one smidgen of wrath left against God's people. Not any. Our sin has been dealt with. It's gone. And then he gives us his perfect righteousness. He imputes his righteousness to us, puts it to our account. God deals with us now as perfectly righteous people. Even though we're not yet, that's how he views and sees us. But we are being made practically that way because the Holy Spirit now has come to indwell us. And the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And he's going to make you and I holy. And when we see God in his holiness, there is nothing more beautiful. When John was caught up to heaven in Revelation and saw what he saw, it was terrifying. It was frightening for him as a human. But it was awe-inspiringly beautiful to him. You read these hymns that we sing on Sundays And you see the words many times describing the beauty of God, the loveliness of God, his glory, the wonder. That's coming from eyes that now see the holiness of God as their greatest delight. It's not a thing to be dreaded or feared now. It is a thing to be delighted in as his people, treasured. And when we get to heaven, I will guarantee you the first thing that you will notice apart from seeing Jesus is the absence of sin, of imperfection, of moral evil. It's not going to be there. And we will immediately know that. We can't even comprehend an atmosphere like that, can we? No evil at all. For God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If Jesus had not come, we'd be in a mess, wouldn't we? But thank God that he has. And he's dealt with sin so that we might be able to stand before a beautiful and holy God as his children. Father, as we close this morning, we recognize that These stammering lips have failed. But Lord, Holy Spirit, as I prayed at the very beginning, what we do not know, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, kindly make us. 
in Jesus' name.